Hello, uh, this is Pete McCall again with Exercise Science 281. Uh, this is Understanding Strength Part 2. In the last part, we kind of define how muscles get stronger via the nervous system, the motor units, the muscle fibers, and some general types of strength. In this uh, lecture, I'll be going to some specific types of strength. Keep in mind that according to General Adaptation Syndrome, that after a certain period of time, the body will get used to and adapt to a certain stimulus, and it'll be necessary at that point to change the type of training or the type of exercise or just change the variables a little bit to make it a slightly different type of workout or slightly different outcome. So when we look at the acute variables, the acute variables are how we design exercise programs. The first is exercise selection. That's the movement that you're doing. And, and remember, you know, you, the traditional model is um, body part training, like you do in chest, back, you know, you're doing a bench press, you're doing you know seated rows, you're doing flies, you're doing pull-ups. Those are all exercises for exercise selection. Um, what I've been suggesting, and, and my, you know, I think the appropriate thing to do is, um, unless you're training for a figure competition or bodybuilding or aesthetic contest, it's very important to train movement patterns as opposed to muscles. So exercise selection should really be a function of is a squat movement, um, and that could be a squat or a hip hinge. That's just a double leg hip hip dominant movement. Is it a single leg movement, which is like a step up, a squat, a single leg squat, a lunge? Is it a push? And pushing can be in front of the body in the transverse plane, in front of the body with the um, with the arms, upper arms next to your body in the sagittal plane, or overhead in either the frontal or the uh, sagittal plane. So we can push in that direction. We can also pull. We can pull from in front of the body like in a row. We can pull from overhead like in a pull-up. So um, when we look at push and pull, you'd use a number of muscles to create those movement patterns. And when possible, it's best to do them standing up, um, you, do, you know, standing chest presses, standing cable rows, because then you're engaged in the entire body. The other movement pattern is rotation. Rotation is where your hips and shoulders are moving um, opposite of one another. Your shoulders are moving, you're looking to, you're turning your torso to your right while your hips are moving to your left. And if you really want to think about it, um, rotation is kind of half push, half pull. The next is intensity. And intensity is the amount of resistance you're using. There are two ways to write intensity. We can either do as a percentage of one rep max, and um, I'll, sh I'll show an easy way to do that in one of the next slides, or you write it as a um, function of the 10 rep maximum. 10 RM means that it's the amount of weight that you should be able to do for 10 reps, no more. If you can do more than 10 reps, increase the increase the weight, because the idea with, with doing a RM or a rep um, range is you want your, your clients, you want to fatigue by the end of the reps. So if you do a six RM, fatigue by the sixth rep. If you're doing a 25 RM, fatigue by the 25th rep. That's just, that's probably the easiest way to write the, um, the intensity for clients. Then tell them, I want you to pick up a weight that you can do for 10 reps. If you can do it for more than 10, add weight. Um, repetition is a single movement. Um, you know, it's both a concentric and eccentric phase. You know, concentric muscle short and eccentric muscle lengthening. It's a full range of motion. Um, you know, most exercises are uh, dynamic, meaning you're moving. Uh, if you're doing repetitions of, of an isometric exercise like a plank or a wall sit, you're only doing one repetition, but you're holding it for an extended period of time. Tempo or time under tension, TUT is time under tension, is the speed of movement. You know, there are generally three phases of muscle action, muscle lengthening, a pause where the muscle stays shortened for a moment, and then a shortening when the, when the muscle is shortening to overcome the, the resistance. So if you think about a chest press, the way down, the, the bar coming to the chest, the muscles are lengthening, you pause, and then you push up in a concentric action. Now, time under tension is one way to create mechanical overload because you're keeping the muscle under resistance longer. If you're working on strength, you're probably going to have um, a little bit longer time under tension. If you're working on power, you're really trying to do as explosive and as fast as possible. Rest interval is exactly what it sounds like. It's the rest between sets. Um, and you, that's, that's very important for metabolic activity, the muscle has to have, have a chance to um, re-energize or recharge or um, just simply, you know, to let the nervous system regroup, rebuild ATP. Um, if you don't want to, if you want to make the exercise harder, minimize the rest period, but understand you'll fatigue sooner. Um, if you're doing, if you're training for a specific goal, like heavy weight training or explosive training, you need a longer rest period to allow the body to completely um, replace ATP and allow the nervous system to completely recover. Sets, we know what that is. That's the number of repetitions. Um, generally, most programs, somewhere between two to four sets can be appropriate. Um, there's, there's a good amount of research demonstrating that about three or four sets uh, is enough to make gains. There are some protocols, which I mentioned in a previous lecture, 
of very high repetitions, or sorry, very high sets, doing eight to 10 sets of a particular exercise. But um, unless you're a professional or you're just very well off and you recently hit the lottery, we don't really have that much time. You have three to four sets for, for movement, for exercise is usually enough. Frequency um, refers to the number of times you're doing that program in a week or a time block. If you're doing a program where you're following a program for two weeks, is your, how many reps you, or how many um, workouts you're doing in the two weeks. Duration is the length of time in a phase. So you'll see each of these for the different types of strength. Now keep in mind, the bottom of the screen, you see intensity, degrees of freedom. Um, this is a, kind of a brilliant, um, I don't wanna say it's a concept, but, my, but uh, Michelle Dalcourt, the Institute of Motion, kind of introduced this idea is that when you have a heavier weight, you have a uh, smaller movement, meaning if you're doing heavy deadlifts, you're picking the weight of about maybe 18 to 20, maybe 24 inches, depending on lib length. Um, if you're doing heavy weight, you, you, you don't wanna walk around with it. If you're doing a lighter weight, like you're using a 20 kilogram um, kettlebell, then you can then you can move around. Then you can like carry the kettlebell. You can do a farmer's walk. You can do overhead carry. So if you lower the intensity, the more movement you can do. You have multiple planes of motion, um, change directions. But the heavier it is, you want to keep that movement a little bit smaller. So here are the acute variables for different kind of general outcomes. In each of the following slides, you'll see specific variables for a specific type of strength. Um, remember when I said I'd talk about uh, percentage one rep max, look at the chart on the bottom. Um, if you can do one rep, that's your one rep max. If you can do three reps, then you're working at about 93% of your one rep max. So that's one way you can kind of calculate one rep max. If you have a client do a weight um, and they can only get seven repetitions, that's going to be about 83% of their one rep max. So if your goal is strength and you know you want to be lifting um, at least 80% of one RM, then you know that you can give them a seven or, you know, give them that weight for them to be successful. Where our one RM, if you're trying to achieve a specific goal like strength and they can do more than 12 or 15 repetitions, they're not necessarily developing strength they're developing endurance, which is a slightly different outcome. So you see the general application of variables for endurance, muscular endurance. You want to generally do more than 12 reps um, for, uh, you know, when you're doing uh, volume training, um, volume training is bodybuilding. What you're trying to do is, is enhance the training volume. That could also be called a hypertrophy, volume slash hypertrophy. Um, you're doing six to 12 reps per set. The idea is you're trying to fatigue the muscle. Um, number of sets, you see that, percentage of one RM. If you look at the numbers, um, 67 RM, 67% is about 12 reps. If you do 12 reps, you're about 67% of your one RM. If you do six reps, you're about 85% of your one RM. And for rest intervals, if your goal is to create, make it more of a metabolic workout, meaning you're working with short, you're, you're increasing your energy expender, expenditure, you're increasing your oxygen consumption, you're increasing the amount of overall work you do, then you can keep the rest intervals shorter. However, if you're focused on strength, as I mentioned earlier, you want to have at least a three minute um, rest interval between heavy sets. You might only do two to three reps um, of a really heavy weight. If you're doing two to three reps, you're doing over 90% of your one RM. And in order to be successful, you need to allow at least uh, three minutes of rest for ATP to fully replenish. So different types of strength. The first one is agile strength. That's where you can generate control and decelerate force in a multiplanar environment. So you're moving, you're generating strength in different directions in different planes. You're able to control um, mass or a weight through gravity. You know, generally we, we talk about lifting quite a bit. Lifting is, is lifting weight generally up and down vertically. But when you're carrying a weight, you're moving away a weight from point A to point B, like in a farmer's carry, or you're throwing a weight, then you're shifting. You know, throwing is different. But if you're, if you're doing a farmer's carry, or like you're moving through space with a resistance, then you're what we call shifting, moving through space. Um, when you're working on agile strength, you're coordinating efforts of both the contractile, the actin myosin cross bridge, and the elastic tissues. You see examples carrying a child, you're, you're moving through space with a weight, tennis, wrestling are all examples. Here are the variables. So when you look at um, agile strength, you're really trying to do multi-joint um, total body movements. Intensity should be relatively light. Remember, degrees of free, you know, the, the amount of weight um, limits the degrees of freedom. So if you're using really heavy weight, you can't really move around with it. Um, if you want to develop really functional strength, then you have to and you have to use a weight that's light enough to allow you to move in multiple planes of motion. Tempo, you can be slow, you can be fast, sets. Um, two to six sets, and that's per movement, per exercise. Rest intervals, you know, it, it depends on what your outcome. If you're trying to develop strength, you want longer rest intervals. If you're trying to improve fitness or conditioning, shorter rest intervals. You can do these workouts two to four times a week because you're really doing a lot of work, 
um, you're going to be, you know, you want to allow at least one full day of rest between, you know, agile strength workouts. So you can do Monday, do an agile strength workout. Tuesday, maybe you do a cycling class or maybe do yoga or maybe you do a run. Wednesday, you can do another strength workout. Thursday, you, you do another lower intensity, but you, you're just putting different stress on the body. Now you're going to see the duration. Each, you know, anytime you do a specific type of strength, keep in mind that after, you know, you're going to get tired of hearing me say it. After 12 to 16 weeks, you got to move on and do something different. Change something so the body's working differently. Um, base strength is a foundation of strength. Um, down below, GPP stands for general physical preparation. General physical prep just means you're conditioning with no specific goal in mind. Like if you're a sprinter, like in Usain Bolt, the, the ex example easier, or I used earlier, um, you're trying to develop really specific strength. But if you're off-season training, you're just trying to get stay strong, that is um, general physical preparation or base strength. So this is what you're doing with base strength is you're working on intramuscular coordination of activating muscle motor units within the fiber. You're trying to get different muscles um, or muscle units to work closer together. You're going to increase force output, the amount of muscle, force the muscle can generate. And that's the interesting thing. If you're doing heavier resistance training, um, you know, two to four, or four to six reps, you're not necessarily going to increase muscle fiber size, but you're going to increase muscle density. The, the fibers are going to get thicker. That's what we call myofibular hypertrophy. You're actually increasing size of individual fibers. Um, when you look at bodybuilding training, you know, you'll see what that is in, in another moment. So applying the variables for base strength, you can either do compound, multi-joint movements, squat, um, you know, clean it, you know, clean jerk is something different, but squat, bent over row, you can do um, chin-ups when you're using the shoulders and the elbows together, um, but you know, you're doing, you want to be able to do either compound, multi-joint, or single joint, leg extension, bicep curl, uh, front raise, um, exercise. You're using a heavy fatigue, your heavy intensity to fatigue. Um, if you can do uh, four reps, you're at about 90% one RM. If you can do 10 reps, you're about 75% RM. With base strength, if you're doing more than 10, you're not developing strength. You're more developing strength endurance, which is a slightly different function. You see the tempo. Um, keep in mind, if you're doing really heavy weight training, you're pushing as hard as you can, so you're trying to have a fast tempo, but the resistance is slowing you down. Um, the mass of the resistance is slowing you down. Number of sets, that's going to be relatively consistent. Rest interval, um, the heavier you go, the longer you need to rest, unless you want to do supersetting, and I'll talk about what that is in a couple of minutes. Frequency, again, you're really fatiguing the body, so you need to allow at least 24 to 48 hours um, between a, a full uh, between using the same movement pattern. So if you do uh, you know heavy training base training on Monday, uh, you probably want to, want to do it again either Wednesday or Thursday, so you have enough time to recover and adapt. Endurance strength is the ability to maintain a consistent level of force over an extended period of time. It requires sustained energy and the ability to remove metabolic waste. When you're doing high rep training, you're not necessarily working on muscle tone, but what you're doing is you're training the muscles how to produce force over an extended period of time. That's where we get into sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. That's hypertrophy of the sarcoplasm or the fluid around individual muscle cells. You know, that's what we call the pump. If you hear a bodybuilder talking about the pump, they're influencing the size of their muscle via sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Um, you can see the examples down below. Here are the variables, the application of the variables. Uh, relatively light, that's where you're going to go um, the higher rep range. If you're training for, like, you know, if you're working with somebody who's doing an ultra, like 50 or 100 mile run, you probably want to have them do high rep ranges, 30 to 40 rep, reps, because that's going to train them how to be consistent with producing force. Um, you can see the different variables. Um, you're going at a slower movement because you're trying to keep the muscle working longer. You're doing um, you know, fewer sets because if you do 30 reps, you're going to fatigue pretty quickly. You don't need to do a high volume of sets. Rest interval is relatively short because um, you're trying to work on the efficiency of which your body can produce energy. And frequency, again, you see duration, you see. Explosive strength is um, maximum amount of force in a minimal amount of time. You, know, you saw in that early um, kind of Zatz, Yorta, Ski, and Kramer define it as dynamic effort. Explosive strength, you just, when you say go, the muscles fire, contracting, you do something explosively. So you're trying to develop fast tension. You see examples of shot put or of Olympic weightlifting snatch and clean and shirt because you're really trying to be as explosive as possible. Here are the rep ranges. Keep in mind, when you look at intensity, if you're really trying to te um, train explosive training, you don't need to use a heavy weight. Your goal is to train as fast as possible. You want to be as fast and explosive as possible. And if you use a heavier weight, you're not going to accelerate all the way through the movement pattern. But if you're using a lighter weight, then you can explode through it. You know, this is a specific reference like medicine ball training. If you're throwing medicine balls, 
that you want to be as fast and as explosive as possible. But if you're using too heavy of a medicine ball, you can't do it. So, you know, if you're really training on explosive, you know, explosive strength, you really want to use light and be as explosive as possible. Now, if you're training for like Olympic weightlifting, snatch, or clean and jerk, then you're going to do heavier, you know, a heavier weight, but you're only going to do one to two repetitions. And that's something to pay attention to. Explosive strength training fatigues the nervous system and places a tremendous amount of stress on the tissue. So you really want to keep your rep range low, no more than about six repetitions. You know, that's where, you know, you have to be really concerned. There are certain protocols that may be having somebody do 15 to 20 um, power cleans, you know, clean and jerks. And that's just silly because your body can't sustain that high level of force for that extended period of time. Explosive strength, six reps or less. Um, if you start losing your energy, the set's done. Allow it for recover. Rest interval, you see longer rest interval. Um, you know, the, the comment there about skill versus conditioning. If you're working on a skill, like if I'm, if I'm working with somebody on, on the snatch, then I want them to have a lot of rest in between because I want their nervous system to recover because the snatch uses a lot of muscles at the same time and it can fatigue the, the, the motor units. Um, however, if I'm working on conditioning, number one, I'm not going to use the snatch. I might use a squat, uh, the squat to overhead press, what are commonly called a thruster, squat to shoulder press. Now I'm going to have you be explosive but do more repetitions. The movement is, is complicated so you can do a higher volume. Frequency, you see a lower frequency because you need a lot of rest between explosive workouts duration. Um, if you're training for a specific event, you want to give yourself anywhere from 12 to, you know, about 12 weeks, 16 weeks to prep for that event. Max strength. This is uh, the sport of powerlifting is actually max strength. Max strength is the highest amount of muscle force um, that you can generate. It's, it's maximal tension against the resistance. You know, if a weight's pushing down, if you see that picture, the weight's pushing down, um, the lifter is trying to generate tension, the muscles to push the weight overhead. You're recruiting, engaging all motor units within a muscle. That's why if you go really heavy, you feel your muscle shaking, you're activating new muscle motor units. It's literally waking up and sending more electricity to the muscle. This is where you achieve myofibular hypertrophy. That's density of the fibers. That's why when you see that picture you know, in the previous um, lecture, you see the pictures of bodybuilders and, and people that train for strongman or weightlifting competitions, you're doing fewer repetitions, so you're developing thicker mass. Bodybuilders are doing more repetitions, so they have, have more fluid in the muscle, and because the muscle's under tension longer, it's going to develop more muscle tone. Um, and that's why I showed that picture of Jay Cutler and Vasily Alexiev, because Vasily Alexiev is very strong, but because he trains in low rep ranges for explosive lifting and max strength lifting, he's not really putting a lot of force into a specific unit of muscle. He's um, developing tension and force throughout the entire body. So you see the different examples there. Here are your variables. Um, you have compound movements. That's where you do bench press, squat, deadlift. That's powerlifting. Um, you're doing multiple joints, multiple muscle groups. You're doing five reps or less if you really want to work on max strength. You know that's where you might do um, sets of two or sets of three, and you can do a high volume of that. You know um, you want to move fast. The weight might not be moving fast because it's heavy, but you want to try to move fast. You need to. Um, you can do more sets. The more sets you do, um, you're going to kind of override the tension and, and train the Golgi tendon organ how to, to be able to sustain a high amount of tension so you can do a high volume of training. But for most people, realistically, doing more than five sets, we just don't have the time in our day. Now, if you're independently wealthy, good for you. Um, you can train it two hours a day, but most people just don't have that freedom. Rest interval, you need longer rest interval to allow um, energy to replenish, nervous system rest. Frequency, if you're doing a higher frequency, that means you're doing like lower body um, on one day, upper body on another. So you can do two lower body workouts in a week for max strength, two upper body workouts in a week for max strength and focus on the movement patterns. Strongman training. Now here, here's the interesting thing. Um, a couple researchers, one by the name of Stuart McGill, um, another one I believe John Cronin out of, uh, out of the UK, they've been doing a lot of research on strongman because what we're seeing is that strong men are, and women are incredibly strong and they don't get the same rate of injuries as bodybuilders. And one of the things they notice is because strongman training use their entire body to develop tension, whereas a bodybuilder is only isolating force in a specific unit of muscle or a specific section of muscle. So strongman training um, can help people become stronger. People of all ages and skill levels. Now you might not have a 75 year old woman carry two kegs, but you could have her carry two 25 pound medicine balls, and, or not 25 pound medicine balls, but 25 pound dumbbells or kettlebells. And I would argue that for a woman in her 70s who wants to remain functionally independent, she should be doing um, heavy-weighted carries 
That'll help her develop the strength, the balance, and the coordination to carry suitcases, to carry groceries, and to be able to maintain a functional independent lifestyle longer. And as our population ages, that's something to pay attention to. We don't start, if somebody's brand new to exercise and they're older, we don't start with strongman training. We develop a base strength. We develop base strength. We develop strength endurance. Then we can transition to doing um, strongman training. You can see the benefits there, and it's definitely appropriate for all people. Speed strength is force applied to a high speed movement. That can be body weight or minimal resistance. And you're trying to apply force rapidly all the way through a range of motion. You see the examples, throwing a ball, you know, football, baseball, um, a soccer ball on a throw-in, a rugby ball, swinging a bat, racket, club, stick. You're trying to develop as much force as possible for a high speed movement. Here you see the variables. Again, when you're working at high speed, you wanna, work, you wanna stay lighter. 15% of body weight um, in intensity, 15% BW, is 15% body weight. That's for medicine balls. So if you're 200 pounds, you probably don't want to use a medicine ball heavier than 30 pounds. And, and realistically, you want to use a lighter medicine ball uh, for 10 or 12, like 10 or 12 pounds because you're really trying to develop explosive strength. Reps, you see, again, relatively low. Um, this is a skill exercise. Um, explosive training and speed strength training, are you're developing a skill of rapid force production. So lower rep ranges, longer recovery period. And that's where you're not really doing it for conditioning, but you're doing it so that, like you see a hockey player, they can move that stick as fast as possible when the time comes. Frequency, duration, pretty much relatively consistent throughout any type of strength. Starting strength is producing force from the beginning of a movement without a pre-stretch. Try this real quick, and I know I've done this in class, but maybe you're listening to this on YouTube, but try this. Scooch to the front of your chair and try to stand up without letting your upper body move. So if you move to the end of your chair, keep your upper body perfectly still and try to stand up, is very tough to do because you're not putting any tension into the system. Most of the time um, when we do a movement, we're, we're kind of rocking a little bit to generate more tension in, in the muscles. But um, starting strength is you're starting from a static position. You see the examples. For most clients we're going to deal with, um, they're going to be rising from a seated position. Heavyweight, older clients need that starting strength so they can get up out of their chair with dignity. You see other examples there from the athletic world. You know, linemen are holding a stance until the quarterback says go. A sprinter is holding a stance until the gun goes off. And when you do a sprint, you, you don't have a chance to rock back. You're starting from a specific static position. Here are the, here are the, um, the variables. And if you're doing starting strength, you're working on a very specific um, pattern for a sport, like sprinting. You know, that's where you might want to do you know, a sled tow. Um, and, and with towing sleds, what they found is um, if you're towing a sled for speed, you probably want to work on about 10% of your body weight or less because if you have a heavier weight, your foot stays in contact with the ground longer. You want to have quick ground contact, generate a lot of force into the ground, and move as explosively as possible. Um, you see the rest of the variables there. I, you know, I assume you can read. I'm not going to read them to you. Um, but you see um, frequency two to four times a week. Keep in mind, if you're doing starting strength, you're probably also training for sport at the same time. So you have to plan that in with your, uh, with your training sessions, with the skill sessions for the sport. Relative strength is the amount of uh, force per unit of body weight. Um, when you see the example here, you have two women that weigh 140 pounds. One can do four pull-ups and deadlift 200. Another can do eight pull-ups and deadlift 220. The, the second one definitely has a higher relative strength because she can generate more force with the same body mass. And there you go. Just a brief overview of the different types of strength. Uh, we got one more lecture to go, and uh, we'll kind of tie it all together. Thank you very much.